Okay, so welcome to part two of the assessment and management of the most common hand and wrist conditions. If you've not seen part one, then do go and check that out because this video won't make much sense as a standalone video. So I'll put a link to part one up here or you can see it in the description below. So in part two, we're going to discuss the soft tissue conditions that can affect the hand and the wrist. Let's get cracking. Okay, so let's move on now and leave um, the osteoarthritis and bony pathologies behind for a, a while and we'll talk about some of the soft tissue problems that we commonly see around the hand and wrist. And first up, we've got de Quervain's tenosynovitis. So this is a condition that involves the first extensor compartment of the wrist, which is abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, which share a compartment and pass under that fibrous tunnel um, close to the radial styloid. And a patient with this condition will be basically pointing with one finger to the radial styloid region as the main area of their symptoms. Um, so it's a condition of APL and EPB and it's an overuse condition. It, there's always an overuse history with this. Um, occasionally it's a single overuse activity that's been done maybe a single activity using very strenuous or heavy load but much more commonly it's repetitive activity over many weeks and months um, and the repetitive activity that's involved is not so much thumb movement like you might think but it's wrist movement it's repetitive ulnar and radial deviation and particularly it's radial deviation under load so it's picking something up lifting it up this way repetitively repetitively and one of the most common groups of people that we see with this are young mums uh, with their picking up of the newborns. Uh, so much so that in the States it's it's called mommy thumb. Um, and because of that, there's a, a, a strong female propensity of around 10 to 1 for this. And it does tend to affect those younger patients. So signs and symptoms, uh, the tendon sheath may be visibly, visibly swollen. Uh, along that line and you can normally see these tendons quite easily as being the one of the borders of the anatomical snuff box as you stick your thumb up um, and you can feel them quite easily but in the queer veins there may be um, a tendon sheath effusion that you can see as well there'll be point tender along that tendon sheath uh, normally most commonly around the region of the radial styloid Finkelstein's and Eikhoff's tests will be positive so these are again pain provocative tests and the differential diagnosis for this condition is often um, basal thumb osteoarthritis. But you note before the two patient groups, so this is much more likely to be seen in the younger group. So that's where age becomes really important. Whereas obviously arthritic changes in the thumb base joints are generally tend to be the older patient. Um, so that's going to help you instantly if you're struggling to differentiate between one and the other. The other's in the history, uh, but also the palpation. So you can easily feel the tendon sheath. You've got your Finkelstein's and Eikhoff's tests, and then you can grab hold of the uh, the basal thumb joints, do your grind tests as well. So hopefully between those uh, those parts of the examination, you can differentiate one from the other. Just worth mentioning that the sister condition to de Quervain's is something called intersection syndrome. So this is a very similar condition, but as you can see on the picture there, the symptoms are a little bit more into the forearm rather than over the radial styloid region. And this is essentially a similar condition, but it's where the extensor um, compartment one tendons, which are APL and EPB, cross over the extensor tendon two tendons, which are um, extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus. And the, it's again, it's a friction syndrome, but rather than the tendons rubbing against a fibrous tunnel like they do in the queer veins, it's the tendons rubbing against each other, if you like. Uh, it's one group of tendons rubbing against an underlying group of tendons and that's intersection syndrome. And the treatment for both of these conditions is pretty much the same. Um, it's an overuse condition, so don't give them exercises, uh, give them rest to start off with. Um, Non-steroidals, again, gels are perfectly adequate, um, and, and ice, um, and give them a wrist splint, okay? Don't, there's no point in giving them a thumb splint because you're trying to prevent radial and ulnar deviation. Um, so often I see people given thumb splints or big uh, wrist splints with an extension piece that goes right down over the thumb, which means that they can't do anything with the hand. Um, in most cases, just a simple wrist splint will be quite sufficient to settle this condition down. 
Injections are the next second line treatment and can be very successful for this condition, very helpful. They carry around about an 80 to 90% success rate and it's a fairly simple and easy thing to do. And then the final option with this condition is surgery. Um, this is It's not often that surgery is required for this condition in my experience. I might send one or two people a year with this um, and I tend to send them after I've had two failed injections um, and only if the patients have got you know fairly significant symptoms. Um, the operation carries around about a 90% plus success rate but if you speak to surgeons they often don't really like doing this and one of the main reasons is um, the uh, superficial radial nerve sits directly over their operating site and it very easily gets irritated with this operation just perhaps with post-operative swelling but it's one of the main reasons why post-operative pain from this operation can sometimes persist for much longer than you might expect uh, which leads to unhappy patients so um, again it's not something that, that is required in most cases but nevertheless is there as a last resort option um, and it is essentially just a, a fairly simple day case done under local anaesthetic and of course whilst the queer veins tenosynovitis is the most common tenosynovitis around the wrist uh, we have lots of other tendons around the wrist which can also become affected by overuse uh, repetitive use uh, scenarios and can become um, inflamed and uncomfortable as well so of course as it says on the on the um, table there if the maximum site of wrist pain is over the dorsal radial side then the queer veins is likely to be um, where you're focusing your attention but if it's the mid dorsal region of the wrist then EPL tenosynovitis uh, has been described extensor digitorum has as well I've seen that a few times uh, extensor indices not so common but uh, has been described in the literature if it's more over the dorsal ulna side, then extensor carpi ulnaris tenosynovitis is relatively common. That, uh, I've seen that a number of times. Um, if it's over the palmar radial side, then flexor carpi radialis tenosynovitis, uh, again, is something which I've seen with relative frequency. And over the ulna side, flexor carpi ulnaris tenosynovitis is also uh, something which is well described. So depending on the particular overuse activity that they're doing, and uh, coupled with where they're pointing their finger as the main area of tenderness, then some of these other tenosynovitises can also be considered. And the uh, treatments are, are very similar. I've just put at the top there, I suspect systemic inflammatory disorder with these, only because um, things like, uh, obviously things like rheumatoid arthritis have a high propensity of developing some of these tenosynovitises. So if you've got somebody particularly with bilateral symptoms and there's not so much of that overuse trauma history, then it's worth considering a systemic inflammatory disorder, sending them off to some, some routine blood tests. Uh, being a sonographer as well can be very helpful with this because putting the probe on, on, on the area of discomfort, you can often see uh, inflammatory changes within the tendon sheaths. Uh, particularly extensor carpi ulnaris, which is on um, on ultrasound, is one of the first um, features of early rheumatoid arthritis that you can pick up. Is is seeing a tenosynovitis of that ten of that particular tendon. Um, so sonography can be really helpful in uh, in identifying an early um, an early inflammatory disorder such as RA. And then beyond that, really, tenosynovitis treatment is just the same uh, no matter what you're dealing with really around the hand and wrist same as the queer veins really in the acute stages you're resting it or you're modifying your activities you're icing it you put in non-steroidal gel on or taking oral medication if need be you're using temporary removable splints and then more in the chronic stage or when it starts to improve then again it's activity modification you can start to do a strengthening regime as per any tendinopathy um, and then we've got the additional options of tendon sheath injection and potential surgery if required. Okay, so moving on to carpal tunnel syndrome now, which is obviously a very common condition, isn't it? Something that we'll all see from time to time. So this is the most common entrapment neuropathy in the upper limb. And it involves the median nerve. As you can see on the picture there, people often forget that the median nerve doesn't occupy the carpal tunnel on its own it shares it with nine tendons so you've got the four 
FDS and the four FTB tendons. Um, and then you've also got flexipolysis longus in there as well. So it's quite a congested area. But while the tendons don't seem to mind it when things get a bit tight in there, the median nerve doesn't like it at all and will classically give symptoms of paresthesia within the median nerve territory. So this is most commonly seen between the ages of 30 and 50, but it can also be seen in the elderly as well. Um, at that 30 to 50 age range, it has a female dominance of around 4 to 1, but as you get into the older age range, it approaches more towards 1 to 1. It's got a general prevalence in society of being between 2.7 and 3.4%, so it's reasonably common. Um, and it has unknown etiology, although you can see it with people that have got wrist arthritis because of the osteophytes and general um, bony thickenings around some of these carpal bones that can invade the carpal tunnel. Um, but it, it, it's more, they think, looking at genetic twin studies, it's more... The most common risk factor is basically your, your genetics. If you've just inherited a slightly smaller carpal tunnel than Joe Average, then you, you're going to be more likely to develop this condition. So the uh, sensory territory of the median nerve uh, is seen in the picture there. So it's, uh, it supplies the radial three and a half digits. Um, so it splits the ring finger in half there with the other half being supplied by the ulnar nerve. And the symptoms are classically going to be paresthesia, paresthesia uh, or the numbness um, and sometimes pain within those three and a half digits. Uh, Thena sparing is something which uh, is sometimes seen clinically. So basically just before the median nerve enters the, car the carpal tunnel, as it passes under the transverse carpal ligament, it throws a little branch off that goes to the thena area on the base of the thumb just there. And so in classical carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, in patients that have got paresthesia that you can assess, then you'll find that their thumb tip uh, maybe uh, have reduced sensation, but the thena area has normal sensation, and that's because it's supplied by this recurrent branch, and that's uh, a a scenario called thena sparing and again ring finger splitting as I mentioned before again is another good diagnostic test for this condition uh, and good for differentiating between something like a cervical radiculopathy. Uh, symptoms are often intermittent particularly during the start they can become continual later on um, but at the start of the condition they tend to be intermittent and mainly nocturnal um, and that's because people tend to sleep with their wrist in a flexed position as they get curled up or in an extended position as you use the hand as a pillow and both of those positions will narrow down the carpal tunnel um, whereas in a more neutral position which we generally don't sleep in um, that's the position where we've got the most room in the carpal tunnel. As the condition progresses um, paresthesia becomes more constant and if it becomes to the constant and unaltering stage uh, then the prognosis for uh, recovery is, is poorer. You can get motor weakness with carpal tunnel syndrome as well. Um, the, the purest innervated muscle by the median nerve in the hand is abductor pollicis brevis. It does supply other muscles, which you can see there, uh, podens pollicis, um, part of FPB and um, lumbricals one and two. Uh, but the purest individual innervated muscle is APB. And when that um, is affected you can often get wastage of that muscle that you can see in the hand there and that sign there is is a sign that you're dealing with somebody that's got fairly severe symptoms um, and normally late stage symptoms and at that stage they may well be complaining of uh, weakness and clumsiness and dexterity loss so diagnosis wise obviously history is very important with carpal tunnel syndrome but just bear in mind that patients generally don't come in complaining of paresthesia in the radial three and a half digits they generally won't discriminate fingers and individual areas that precisely particularly in most in more severe symptoms they will just tell you that their hand is tingly um, and that's been found in research studies as well where patients with proven carpal tunnel syndrome uh, will often complain of whole hand symptoms sometimes according to them involving the the, the palmar and dorsal side of the hand although when you test them clinically you will find that it, it is affecting just the median nerve territory but they won't say that so just bear that in mind and there's also anatomical variants with some people as well um, including the median nerve distribution some people 
um, will have median nerves that split the little finger or the middle finger rather than the ring finger. Um, and there's also an anastomosis called the Martin Gruber anastomosis that basically connects the median and all the nerve together. And that could be another cause of, of whole hand paresthesia. So just bear in mind that, um, that those can occur. Uh, clinical testing, we've obviously got our classical um, uh, way of, te of testing the, the digits. And we've mentioned before that ring finger splitting and thena sparing are, are strong um, clinical evidence of the condition. But we've also got our provocative tests, our phalans, tinels and carpal compression tests. Um, and they carry sensitivity and specificity figures as seen there. Nerve conduction tests uh, do have a role in diagnosis, um, but bear in mind that this is a clinical diagnosis, is carpal tunnel syndrome. It's not a neurophysiological diagnosis. So, it, you know, having, um, having positive nerve conduction tests is not diagnostic. It's not the, the, the be all and end all. I tend to use them um, when I've got a, a patient with mixed symptoms and I'm not 100% convinced and I just need a little bit of certainty. Um, but bear in mind that they do have high false positives. Um, and so you've got to put the results into context with the rest of the history and examination findings. Uh, injection itself, well, we use them obviously therapeutically, but you can also use them as a diagnostic test themselves. And they carry a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 50%. Differential diagnosis for carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, there are so many different conditions that can cause hand tingling and paresthesia. Um, some of the more common ones are listed here. So, of course, we know that cervical radiculopathy and myelopathy can cause hand paresthesia. Um, thoracic outlet syndrome can. You could have somebody that's got a median nerve lesion, but not in the carpal tunnel that's more proximal. And probably the more, most common one of those is pronator syndrome, which is where the median nerve becomes pinched within the two heads of pronator teres. Um, and that can produce similar type of symptoms, but they will have um, often have muscular pain in the forearm that may be aggravated with forearm movements. Um, and they won't have that thena sparing that I mentioned before, because, of course, uh, their lesion is proximal um, to the carpal tunnel itself. Um, and sometimes they can have muscle involvement as well. And if they do have muscle involvement and they have weakness, then there is a, a test called the OK sign where you get them to pinch like so. If they can do that, then that's negative. But if they collapse down like that, then that's positive. And that's because uh, the median nerve proximal to the carpal tunnel innervates flexipolysis longus and, that's, and also um, the flexor um, profundus that uh, controls DIP movement on the index finger. So if they can't do that and they collapse down, then that's a positive OK sign and is indicative of a proximal median nerve lesion. And then, of course, there are the peripheral neuropathies and polyneuropathies. Uh, so the metabolic uh, issues such as diabetes, alcoholism, thyroid disease, uh, B12, folate deficiencies, that sort of thing, uh, which can be picked up on, on blood tests. Um, and they can all produce paresthesia and numbness symptoms in the hand um, but bear in mind that they will usually produce symptoms in both hands and often both feet and symptoms will often be fairly continual and not sort of altering like carpal tunnel syndrome often is um, also inflammatory disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disorders such as lupus can commonly produce hand paresthesia um, many drug reactions can also produce hand paresthesia so if symptoms have occurred uh, when the patient has recently started a new medication, then just bear that in mind as well. Have a quick flick through the side effects profile of those drugs. Um, and then things like fibromyalgia and Raynaud's have also got amongst their plethora of symptoms um, uh, includes um, hand paresthesia. Treatments. So splints, I will generally, for patients that have got intermittent symptoms, particularly nocturnal, I would always start with a splinting regime. Um, and that can be very effective. Um, and all you're trying to do with a splint is stop them from getting into these flexed or extended positions at night and keep them in a neutral position. Um, and the idea behind the splint is not, it's not a fob off, it's not to try and just make them feel comfortable. And I'll be very clear to explain to patients 
um, that the idea behind these splints is to try and promote a normal recovery of the median nerve. So by preventing them from squashing it every night, we're going to put it in the optimal position and then hopefully nature will do its thing and it will get itself better. So I'll be strongly promoting this as being a curative treatment. Um, and by doing that, I'm hoping to ensure that they do take it seriously and wear it every night. Because if they do, it's got a fighting chance of settling those intermittent and predominantly nocturnal symptoms down. I'll tend to get them to use it for two months and then if they're feeling okay with it and things have improved, then perhaps to wean off at that point. Physiotherapy, there is limited evidence that so-called median nerve gliding or nerve flossing exercises can sometimes be helpful. Um, it's not going to do any harm, um, so by all means you can give them a go. Uh, but the evidence is fairly sparse really and these studies are normally only very small um, okay uh, injection so as a treatment uh, they can be uh, very effective and I tend to find them much more effective in mild to moderate symptoms and uh, much less effective particularly in the long term for more severe or continual symptoms uh, the stats show us that it's got around an 80% success rate at six weeks and that drops down to around 20% at the 18 month mark. Uh, but like I said, that I think that does depend personally and clinically from what I've seen on the severity of the symptoms. So uh, if I've got somebody with mild intermittent symptoms, I will often use injection. Uh, but if it's something that is continually numb, then I generally won't bother and I'll send them straight through to see a hand surgeon. Uh, but like we mentioned before, injections can also be useful as a diagnostic test uh, if required. So surgery, um, which consists of uh, division of the transverse carpal ligament, uh, is a very successful procedure if the diagnosis is right. Um, and it's a very straightforward thing. Um, it's done under local anaesthetic. It takes less than five minutes to do. Um, they have a big boxing glove bandage on for a couple of weeks and then they're free to get their hand moving again. Uh, it can be quite sore for quite a few weeks after the procedure and so um, I generally advise people, particularly if they've got any sort of manual job, to think about six weeks off work for this. If they've got a lighter job, they might be lucky to get back at three or four weeks. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that we're talking about there um, and is a, um, a very successful operation for the right person. Okay, moving on to cubital tunnel syndrome. So this is the second most common upper limb entrapment neuropathy uh, behind carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a condition that involves the ulnar nerve at the elbow. So the ulnar nerve uh, travels through the cubital tunnel on its way um, from the upper arm into the forearm and it travels between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon um, the floor of the cubital tunnel is the medial collateral ligament and the roof of it is this arcuate ligament. And the key thing with this anatomical area is that the tunnel is drawn tight during elbow flexion and therefore can compress and pinch that nerve um, and it's relaxed in positions of elbow extension. And the condition is essentially usually caused by a compression or a friction or a traction of the ulnar nerve within the um, cubital tunnel. So causes, um, it can be idiopathic, but it's often associated with either repetitive sustained elbow flexion positions, um, and that's something that could occur occupationally, like in the picture there, uh, or particularly nocturnally. People do like to get all curled up at night, um, and that can put pressure on the ulnar nerve um, or it could be due to um, somebody leaning through their elbows a lot and you've got direct pressure onto the cubital tunnel. Um, or it could be a direct trauma, it could be a bang on the funny bone that causes those tingly feelings um, as well. Just bear in mind that the ulnar nerve, I mean, you can feel it quite easily on yourself. Um, and one of the ways of palpating it essentially is if you put your um, finger, your index finger onto the electron in there, then you put your sorry, you put your middle finger onto the olecranon, and you put your thumb onto the medial epicondyle and then imagine the distal point of an equilateral triangle, put your index finger on there, press and just wiggle from side to side and you're directly on the ulnar nerve. That's not the cubital tunnel, that's just as it's exited it and it's about to sort of dive into 
plexocarpi ulnaris muscle but that's the area where you can where you can feel it um, um, and often with people that have got this condition you'll often feel that it's quite tender around that area and you might get a positive tinnitus test if you bang on that area um, getting back to the slide so uh, yeah this is a condition where men tend to um, develop this condition more than women at the rate of around about five to one so the symptoms are paresthesia and numbness in that ulna one and a half digits um, and then you can sometimes and not always get pain and sensitivity around the uh, medial aspect of the elbow as well often the conditions are worsened with sustained elbow flexion like we mentioned before or leaning through the elbow um, and there may be pain like i mentioned on palpating around the area and you may have a positive tenel sign um, because we know that uh, it's got this nocturnal factor and because people tend to sleep with their, with their elbows all bent up this tends to be a condition which is often worse at night and particularly first thing in the morning uh, so they're often waking up with these symptoms and have to literally shake their arm out and straighten their elbow out in order to um, restore sensation the ulnar nerve also supplies certain muscles around the hand um, and uh, during its more advanced stages these uh, muscles can become weak and that produces symptoms of clumsiness and weakness um, and they do tend to be a later feature of the condition so diagnosis wise we've got sensory loss of the ulnar nerve territory uh, like we can see on the uh, picture there we've got a positive tenel sign at the elbow uh, if the if the muscles are involved then we do get some uh, classical areas of wastage so uh, some of the main muscles involved are the adductor pollicis uh, and the interossei um, and what you can see there in the picture on the right is that we've got wastage of the thena area which is adductor pollicis and then wastage of the gaps between the metacarpals uh, producing that dorsal guttering um, and you can as a result of that you can see the extensor tendons much more clearly uh, on the affected side than on the other side Froman's test is a test for adductor pollicis weakness. Um, I think historically you were supposed to get the patient to grab hold of a £10 note with this, but the idea is you get them to grab hold of a piece of paper uh, without using their thumb tip. And if they can't do it and they have to flex the, eye, the thumb IP joint, um, then that's a positive test because having to compensate for weakness of adductor pollicis. Uh, fingers cross test is basically a test of, of interossei weakness if they can't cross the fingers over then that's indicative of uh, weakness there and Wartenberg sign there is where the little finger will tend to drift out to the side at rest and that's again another motor uh, sign for uh, fairly advanced cubital tunnel syndrome differential diagnosis um, well probably the most common one is an ulnar nerve compression elsewhere uh, other than the, the cubital tunnel and the most common area for that is Guyon's canal which is that area in the ulnar border of the wrist as the ulnar nerve travels underneath the hook of the hamate so this will give very similar symptoms uh, except that the area of paresthesia tends to be only over the palmar surface of the little and ring fingers and not the dorsal surface so that's one differential test uh, the other differential test is that they will be tender over the hook of the hamate and they may have a positive tenel sign in that area. Uh, this condition is uh, most common in cyclists just because of the pressure through the Guyon's canal region of the wrist with many hours of cycling and the pressure that's going through there. The other common differential diagnosis will be a C8 radiculopathy uh, because those fingers are um, within the C8 dermatome. Uh, but just bear in mind that uh, they, they, they won't have the ring finger splitting if it's um, if it's a radiculopathy whereas they will do it generally if it's um, if it's an ulnar nerve problem treatment wise um, there is uh, reportedly a 60% spontaneous recovery rate of this condition within about nine months and in my experience it's it's probably even higher than that really um, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with just waiting and seeing if this condition uh, will get better particularly if it's uh, an intermittent paresthesia and symptoms are fairly mild um, but one of the most common things that you can do and you might as well do if you're waiting 
um, is to provide or offer some sort of splinting for the elbow. So this is something to try and prevent them getting into positions of elbow flexion at night. If you buy a cubital tunnel splint, you'll get something like the one at the bottom picture there, which will keep the elbow fully straight. Now you wear this at night um, and it will be effective, but if you try sleeping with your elbow fully extended at night, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable and a bit weird. And if you're a person who's used to sleeping all curled up, you know, you're not going to like it. So you don't have to use one of those. You don't have to keep the elbow fully straight for a splint to be effective. You just have to stop it from bending fully. So if you can find some way of blocking it around that, perhaps getting no more past than say 90 degrees, then it should be equally as effective. So what I've done in the picture there at the top right is I think I've used a little towel um, just over the elbow crease and then I've wrapped a crepe bandage around it so that I can move the elbow but I just can't bend it beyond about maybe 120 degrees there and that should be more comfortable than using the, the formal splint uh, but it should be equally as effective and in fact a patient only literally the other week uh, told me that they in order to do the same thing they'd use their child's water wing, you know, these inflatable water wings that you put around your upper arms when you're learning to swim. Well, uh, she put that over her um, elbow and it worked perfectly, um, doing exactly the same thing. She could move her elbow, but she just couldn't bend it beyond about so far. Um, and again, that's gonna be something that I'll be recommending to my patients as well. Uh, so a child's water wing, bear that one in mind. Physiotherapy, again, a bit similar to median nerve flossing exercises in carpal tunnel syndrome. There are ulnar nerve flossing exercises in um, in this condition. And again, there's very limited evidence, uh, but they have been described in the literature. Feel free to give them a go. And then surgery is the last option for this. And surgery, for me, I, I generally would wait until at, they've at least reached that nine month mark just to uh, give them every chance that it's going to spontaneously recover um, unless there is significant motor deficit and in that case I will be uh, I will be much earlier in referring to see a, uh, an upper limb surgeon. So the surgeons have generally got three operations at their disposal. The first is uh, decompression where they just release the arcuate ligament uh, and decompress the cubital tunnel. Uh, the second is probably the most popular operation, which is the anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve, where the surgeon basically moves the ulnar nerve from the extensor side of the elbow to the flexor side, so that now when the elbow is fully flexed, uh, the ulnar nerve isn't stretched. And then the last one is described in the, li in the literature, uh, but uh, is probably very rarely used now, but is a medial epicondylectomy. Um, which basically removes the medial epicondyle and therefore removes the bony um, area of the cubital tunnel where the nerve is likely to get pushed up against. Okay, moving on to some of the lumpy, bumpy conditions that patients may complain of. Uh, um, we'll discuss Dupuytren's disease first because that's quite a common condition that uh, we see. So this is an inherited disorder causing proliferative hyperplasia of the palmar fascia. So this has a male propensity of about eight to one. Um, it's usually over 50 before symptoms arise, um, which is quite unusual because this is an, an inherited condition. Uh, we think it was uh, a condition that arose from a mutation in the Vikings. Uh, hence, it gets its alternative name of Viking hand. And if you look at a map where the Vikings got to, particularly in Europe, and superimpose it with a map where this condition is more prevalent, you'll see that you're looking at pretty much the same map, hence why they thought that the, the mutation occurred in the Vikings. Um, but it's unusual for a genetic disorder. Most genetic disorders obviously um, display their symptoms at birth or early in life, but this is much, much older in most people and it's often over 50. Um, there is an association with diabetes, so there's something about diabetes that causes these genes to become expressed uh, perhaps a bit earlier and potentially more aggressively, um, so that's just worth bearing in mind. So signs and symptoms of this condition, um, they can range from a small palmar pit, like you can see on the picture on the left there, or a little nodule, 
um, and probably more commonly you get this thickened cord or band that can occasionally uh, sh sort of shrink along its length and then produce that classical digital flexion contracture that you see. It's usually painless, although it can be painful when it first presents, uh, but the pain will often be short-lived and tend to fade away within a few months. Uh, the little and ring fingers are by far the most commonly affected. Treatment wise, uh, physiotherapy has no role to play in this condition. Um, so if you see it as a physiotherapist, then generally uh, uh, pass it on um, or reassure them. We'll discuss the treatment options in a moment. Uh, so treatment is really only indicated if contractures are intrusive, otherwise reassure and discharge. Um, so what what do, what do I mean by intrusive? Well, generally, if their finger is bent to the point where it's getting in the way, if they're poking the finger in their eye when they're washing the face, if they can't get the hand into the pocket and it's generally causing them some functional difficulties, then treatment is, is, is indicated. Um, but if it's not, if it's only just slightly bent or if it's not bent at all, then no treatment is required. The patient can be reassured and discharged and told to represent if they do get to the stage where the finger does bend down um, to that intrusive degree. Corticosteroid injection can sometimes be helpful, but only for that painful um, scenario when it first presents, and really only if the pain is really bothering the patient. I, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've injected a Jupitron's band, um, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a described treatment uh, for a painful Jupitron's band if it's just not settling down as quickly as the patient might like. And then the treatment options for a, a contracted finger. So the most minimally invasive is probably, needle, is probably needle fasciotomy. So this is an option where the patient has got an MCP contracture. So they've got that the bend from the finger there rather than the PIP joint. Uh, and if it's an MCP joint contracture, then the surgeon has got the option of numbing the uh, the band uh, with some local anaesthetic and then using a needle as a scalpel almost to try and just carefully divide and cut away into the tight band. Uh, this is normally a, a procedure that's done in a clinical outpatient environment. Um, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes. And in some cases, you can get the contracture um, release down so that the finger is almost fully straight or sometimes completely fully straight um, and it's minimally invasive so it's a, a great option for some people. Collagenase injections are these injections that dissolve away the the, the collagen involved uh, in this condition. Um, it seems to have fallen out of favour. I'm not an expert on this treatment. I know that the procedure involves injecting the collagenase into the band on one day and then you come back the next day and then the surgeon uh, basically stretches the finger out and breaks down the um, the dissolved collagen and then you splint them for a while afterwards um, and that's it job done but it seems to have either fallen out of favor over the last few years or I'm not sure if it didn't get nice approval and that was the reason why it's not used so much now um, and I did also hear there was a supply issue as well but for whatever reason um, I haven't seen it used for the last couple of years uh, instead what they're tending to do in, is surgery which is fasciectomy. So that's the um, a, an open procedure where they do a Z-shaped incision into the palm of the hand and they basically release the uh, contracted element of the palm of fascia. Dermofasciectomy is an option for the, it's normally reserved for the younger patient. So bear in mind, this is an inherited disorder. Um, and if it occurs more early in life and you say 20s or 30s or so, then it's much more likely to be more aggressive and therefore the patient may have to have multiple fasciectomies over their lifetime because of course you have a fasciectomy it help, it treats the symptoms but it doesn't cure the genetic problem and so it can recur um, and therefore you know these patients can sometimes have repeated procedures but it was found that if you took a skin graft you're normally from the forearm and place that skin graft of non-diseased tissue if you like over the fasciectomy scar um, it reduced the recurrence rate down significantly. Not quite sure why, um, but it seems to work very well. And so dermofasciectomy is um, 
is a, an option for those younger patients where the condition is likely to be more aggressive. And then finally, if you've got a patient who's just left it too late and their finger is stuck right down into full flexion, so much so that the surgeon's got pretty much no chance of getting a good outcome and the finger is really getting in the way and is essentially useless anyway, um, then digital amputation is a potential option as well. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, other common lump and bump around the hand and wrist, and that's ganglion cysts. So I'm sure we've all seen these. These are the egg-shaped soft swellings uh, that occur around the, around the wrist commonly. Um, the key features of these is that they are often freely mobile, as in you can grab hold of them and move them around the underlying tissues, and the skin is usually freely mobile over the top of them. Um, they're often non-tender, um, although they can be tender if they're pushing up against pain-sensitive structures, uh, or if you have a patient with them, and this tends to be um, the young female patient uh, who are quite a high, uh, have a high propensity of developing this condition, um, and they're worried about it, and they're poking and prodding it all the time. They can sometimes make it sore because of that type of behaviour. Um, but generally, it's it's considered to be a non-tender cyst the dorsal side of the wrist is the most common site as seen in the picture there although and they can occur on the radio on the radial side as well most commonly over the radio palmar region um, as you can see and what they are essentially is a, is a is usually a herniation of the carpal synovium so this is basically a a weakness in the capsule of the underlying joint that's basically ballooned out. Uh, so the contents of it are normal synovial fluid, essentially. But it's just ended up in the wrong place. You can also get a herniation of the tenosynovium. Um, so it's the same scenario, except that the, it's now a herniation of the tendon sheath. Um, and clinically, you're not going to be able to tell if it's one from the other, really. They're both going to look exactly the same. Uh, but the contents of it are like a clear... Uh, gelatinous material which is essentially synovial fluid they can sometimes stack on top of each other or have internal membranes that create almost separate ganglions within one larger ganglion which sometimes gets referred to as a loculated ganglion and there's an example there in the picture this is what they look like an ultrasound which is probably the best investigation to to confirm them so they look like um, a speech bubble in a cartoon. So you've got this dark area, which is normally spherical. Um, it's normally got very clear boundaries. And you've got this neck that extends down into the into the underlying joint or tendon sheath where it arises. And with ultrasound, you can usually tell if, it's, um, if the source of it is a joint or a tendon sheath. And then it has these characteristic features. So the lesion itself is normally anechoic, meaning that there's no internal echoes. Um, you've normally got something called uh, acoustic enhancement underneath it, which means that uh, the area directly underneath it appears quite bright compared to the surrounding tissues, and that's a, an ultrasound artifact. Um, when you switch the Doppler on, uh, which measures movement and flow, you'll find that there's nothing going on inside it, so that excludes it from being you know, a blood vessel aneurysm or something of that nature. And that's your classical ultrasound appearance. Treatment, well... You can reassure the patient these are essentially harmless lesions. And I'll often explain to the patient, look, this is not going to do any harm. It's normal body fluid that's just ended up in the wrong place. Um, you can leave it alone. And if it's not painful, some people will choose to do that. Um, however, if it is the younger age group, particularly the young female age group, they're not going to be very happy with putting up with an unsightly lump on their wrist. And so they're going to opt for one of the other treatment options. Uh, which is either to aspirate and the the process I use is basically to uh, inject some local anaesthetic into it using a small needle um, that serves two purposes one is to numb it uh, and the second um, reason is that it can dilute the the fluid inside the, the uh, ganglion which can be quite gelatinous and make it a little bit easier to get up through the larger bore needle that you then introduce and in my experience you can still block the needle up fairly easily and therefore you have to end up squeezing it like a spot to get the, rem the remnants out. Um, aspiration can be very successful, but it can recur. I generally will offer up to three aspirations before 
uh, deciding to send the patient to see a hand surgeon and surgeon and, and surgery is the last option so that involves basically cutting the uh, ganglion out um, and it's going to leave a scar essentially that's the the downside of it so if it's if they're going in to have this done for cosmetic reasons what essentially they're doing is they're swapping a lump for a scar and they've just got to understand that and sometimes you know it can reoccur after surgery as well so they may end up with a lump and a scar uh, and be worse off than when they first started so it's just something that uh, patients have to bear in mind so in in my opinion aspiration is is preferable this picture uh, i've just put up uh, because the radio palmer ganglions whilst it might be tempting to try and aspirate them without any image guidance they generally tend to nestle up against the radial artery fairly intimately as you can see on the picture there um, and with when you're aspirating with a larger bore needle you're sometimes swiping the needle around to try and get all the contents out um, and you really don't want to be sort of slicing through the radial artery so whilst I'm, i would i would be quite happy for people to have a go at uh, dorsal um, ganglion aspiration without any image guidance i generally would discourage people from um, from aspirating a, a palmar ganglion uh, without image guidance just one thing most worth mentioning on this slide is the ganglion red herring so occasionally you'll get a lump on the back of the wrist uh, which looks like a ganglion but feels quite bony um, and, it, and it actually is bony <laughs> and if you x-ray it you'll see that it's something called a, a carpal boss or a metacarpal boss and this is basically formed by uh, thickenings on the joint margins um, on the back of the wrist it tends again it tends to be young females that, that this tends to occur in um, and one of the things that you can do just to determine if it is a carpal boss or not is it'll often sit much prouder in wrist flexion and you can feel it as a firm lump and yet when you take the wrist into neutral or extension it'll seem to sink right down and almost vanish uh, obviously the x-ray is the conf is the confirming test um, and these are often just reassured these patients are often reassured uh, because they tend to be non-painful it's more of a cosmetic thing and they can be reassured uh, and just left alone uh, because the only other treatment is to have them uh, surgically chiseled off you can also get ganglions in the fingers as well but we call them by different names so you can get a pearl or a seed ganglion on the palmar surface of the um, of the MCP joint of a finger uh, that tends to be associated with one of the flexor tendons um, and it's called a pearl ganglion because it does look just like a pearl uh, when it's looked at surgically or excised surgically uh, and it often presents as quite a firm um, lump over that area which is often not tender or particularly painful but it's just in a really awkward spot that when you're grabbing hold of an object like a cup it, it's just there and interfering and and just feeling un uncomfortable for want of a better word um, the preferred treatment for that is is just to to aspirate it with a needle and often all that you need to do is just is just put your needle in and it bursts fairly instantly and then it's it's kind of job done really um, it's a very satisfying uh, treatment because there's not many things that come in to see us as msk clinicians where you can see them diagnose and treat them uh, and completely resolve the problem within a single session um, and it would rarely come back again as well uh, so what i tend to do with those is draw a little bit of local anesthetic up with a two mil syringe and a small orange needle um, pop, put the needle directly into the into the little cyst and normally by the time i've even started to inject the local it's already burst and gone and you can get the patient to have a feel afterwards and just confirm that it's gone they're normally happy as anything and then that's it job done um, when it occurs over the ip joints then it generally gets referred to as being a synovial cyst but it's the same pathology and the same treatments are available um, you can aspirate or you can send them off to the surgeons this picture just shows what uh, these pearl ganglions look like on ultrasound so as you can see there it's a little uh, dark spherical uh, cyst but it's sat directly on top of the tendon um, and if you look very carefully on the bottom right hand side you can just see the neck of it uh, which is continuous with the tendon sheath um, and again that's what it kind of looks like as a diagrammatic picture as well on the right when these cysts occur um, in the DIP joint and particularly over the dorsal side next to the nail bed uh, they get another name and they get uh, called digital mucus or myxoid cysts 
um, and that's exactly what they look like. That one on the right there is mine, um, and it went away by itself. Um, but you can see there on the bottom image that what the the risk with this really is that it can interfere with um, with nail growth. Um, and as you can see on this one here, it started to cause some streaking and affect the health of the of the nail. So that's a digital mucus cyst. Now, these ones are often associated with DIP joint OA because the most common cause of this is a little osteophyte of the joint that erodes a little hole through the um, through the joint capsule essentially and creates that avenue where the um, underlying synovial fluid can herniate th through and then build up. Now, if if the mucus cyst is directly over the DIP joint and it's away from the nail, then you can aspirate that. But if it's close to the nail bed, then you have to be very cautious because nails are dirty, mucky things and the rate of infection is, is much, much higher. So your aseptic technique has got to be spot on and you've got to make sure that the patient follows their uh, post-injection advice to keep the area really spotlessly clean and dry um, afterwards in order to get that risk of infection down to as low as possible. I've seen a number of times over my career patients that have developed these themselves and then it's either burst spontaneously near the nail like the one in the picture or they've poked it with a needle themselves and tried to you know burst it themselves and it's near the nail bed. The amount of times these get infected is, is quite high. Um, an infected finger is really not a nice thing to have. It can be exceptionally painful um, and it can often involve hospital treatment um, requiring intravenous antibiotics. So, you know, it's something that is, you have to be very careful with. Um, surgical excision is the preferred treatment where they're near the nail bed, really, because what the surgeons will do, as well as sort of removing the, the, the cyst itself, is they'll just knock off the little osteophytes um, which have caused it in the first place, and that seems to reduce the risk of recurrence uh, quite significantly. Yeah, that's just showing there the uh, little osteophyte there of the DIP joint, which is what the surgeons will, will remove uh, when they're doing the procedure. So that's just a, a summary of the uh, ganglion cyst that you commonly get around the wrist um, and on the fingers. Okay, so we're on to trigger digits now. So again, this is another common problem that I see with relative frequency. This is stenosis of the A1 pulley or more commonly a flexor tendon nodule developing. Um, again, why people get it, we're not quite sure. Um, it affects the ring finger mostly, followed by the thumb, the middle, the index, and lastly the little finger. Um, it has a preference of six to one women to men, um, age 50 to 70 in the literature, lifetime incidence of two to three percent in the general population. That's just a little diagram of what happens. So you've got a, a tendon nodule that when the patient flexes their finger, it slides through the A1 pulley, but then gets jammed on the other side and can't extend. So the patient bends the finger, the finger gets stuck into flexion and then they can't extend it again. And then often they have to grab hold of the finger and then force it out and it suddenly releases with a quick um, snapping sensation or triggering sensation. So that's the presentation. Intermittent catching or sticking with digital flexion and then often a palpable click at the A1 pulley level. On examination, they're often tender over the palmar region of the MCP joint, uh, which is essentially the A1 pulley level. And there's often a palpable thickening around that area, which is the nodule essentially. Um, occasionally you do see people with a lock trigger, so they bend it and it sticks and no matter how hard they try, they cannot straighten it from a flex position. If you do see somebody with that and it's happened relatively quickly, then it does require uh, urgent treatment, usually a quick injection. Um, and if that fails to get it straight, then uh, a quick referral to a hand surgeon, because the longer that finger stays in that position, then the ligaments are going to shorten, the joint capsule is going to tighten, and that finger, particularly the PIP joint, um, it's going to be a hell of a job for the physios to try and get that straight, even after their trigger finger has been surgically treated um, so yeah that does require urgent treatment so treatment 
um, splinting can be certainly helpful. So that involves using a splint to keep the finger straight at night. Um, patients with this condition will often wake up in the morning uh, with their finger locked into flexion. Um, and that's because we tend to sleep with our fingers slightly bent or some people will sleep with the finger, you know, with the hands in a fist almost. Um, but invariably they'll wake up in the morning and the finger will be locked down and they'll have to sort of force it straight. So splinting the finger at night can be um, can be very effective uh, as well as uh, using anti-inflammatories uh, over the A1 pulley region and sometimes ice massage to that area as well. So those three treatments can be worth a go. They're not going to get it better instantly. It'll take a few weeks and I would normally advise them to use these treatments up to about six weeks um, and is often worthwhile for the milder ones. Um, however, if they don't work or if the symptoms are more uh, significant then injection really is the is the best treatment option so that carries a 90 percent success rate uh, with up to two injections um, and that's that can be very very effective and if they haven't uh, got better after two injections then uh, i would then refer them on to see a hand surgeon uh, and the treatment is the surgical division of the a1 pulley uh, which nearly always works if they do have like i said an acute lock trigger like i mentioned before a quick injection and then get them reviewed again within two weeks. Um, and if it's still locked at that point, then it's, uh, again, off to hand surgeon with relative urgency. This is just a great video. Um, I can't claim credit for this. Uh, this was um, uh, Dan Walkley, who's a physiotherapist and sonographer in Australia. Um, I've tried to ultrasound some of these trigger digits, but I can never keep the probe in the perfect place throughout the entire triggering process but Dan seems to have done it brilliantly here so what this essentially shows is that's the, the flexor tendon highlighted in green and the joint underneath highlighted in yellow and over the top is the A1 pulley in red where the arrow is pointing and then what you can see now is the tendon with the nodule there just butting up against the A1 pulley you can see it there and that's the thickness of the nodule and then eventually as the patient flexes their finger it goes through the pulley snaps through and there we've got the pulley sorry there we've got the tendon nodule on the other side of the pulley and it's got stuck there and that's a lovely little real-time ultrasound uh, image of a triggering digit courtesy of Dan Walkley okay so well done for making it to the end and if you've already watched part one, then you're now an expert in the assessment and management of common hand and wrist conditions. This next section is basically a Q&A that I did after one of my talks. Um, and bear in mind that this is related to both part one and part two. So feel free to stick around. It's only five or ten minutes and there's some interesting questions and hopefully some interesting answers. OK, so let's get on with that. So I'll finish off there. Um, um, I've got some time, just five minutes for any questions. And I can see that a few of them have come in here now. Uh, let's have a little look through. Okay, so first one, how is hemochromatosis diagnosed and treated? That was a quick one. Um, okay, well, that's probably a question best asked to a hematologist, really. Um, but it's diagnosed on blood tests. Um, and classically, they have uh, raised ferritin level. Um, it's fairly significant as well. Um, and it's treated, uh, as I understand it, with regular blood transfusions or partial blood transfusions um, because there is no treatment uh, or no curative treatment for it. Um, and that's often fairly, fairly effective. Um, right, next question. I have a patient with a very painful Hebidens node. What are the options? Okay, so the Hebidens nodes are the osteoarthritic nodal thickenings over the DIP joints of the of the finger so if it's just one very painful one well like I mentioned before the treatments really that Coban wrap can be really helpful um, particularly for those joints um, in my experience though over time they rarely become painful for the long term they do tend to burn themselves out those joints and eventually it'll probably fuse um, and when it fuses it'll be uh, generally painless um, even though it'll look very nasty and arthritic on x-ray and they won't be able to move it, but you can manage with a fused DIP joint very well without any issues. Um, so hopefully that might that might be the way that this one progresses and the symptoms therefore um, drop down. 
Um, but if it doesn't, then you can inject them. That can be helpful. Obviously, it won't cure them of having um, an arthritic joint on x-ray, but it can be helpful um, in terms of pain. Um, and that can be worth a go. I would always do those under ultrasound guidance because it's a really teeny tiny fiddly joint. Um, and then ultimately, the only surgical option if it got to that stage would be fusion. You know, you can't do joint replacements of those joints, but you can. The, the surgeons can fuse them, and they'll fuse them in a slightly bent position to about maybe 30, 40 degrees so that they've got a functional grip. Um, but obviously, if it's fused, it'll no longer be painful. So those are the, the options, really, with a painful Hebbidens node. Uh, next question. What was the trigger finger injection technique in the picture? I haven't seen that technique before. Right, okay. Yeah, so the classic way of injecting a trigger finger is to go through the palmar crease there. But the problem with that technique is it can be quite painful. There's a neurovascular bundle there, and it's just a generally richly innervated area with no susceptors, isn't it, the palmar side of the hand. Uh, so my preference is to do what's called the mid-axial technique, which is where you go into the side of the finger there. Uh, trying to show you there. there. Um, I've described this technique in in considerable detail on my YouTube channel, which is Physio MSK. So if you go and have a look at that, um, I've demonstrated that condition in full detail and I've uh, done an, um, uh, an injection uh, on video for you to have a look at as well. So do, do check that out because I think it, in the there's very limited evidence to support it in terms of evidence but uh, one of the papers that I've, that, I've, that I've used as a reference for that shows that it's equally as effective to the standard technique but it's quite considerably less painful and that's the main reason why I use it because um, it's less painful but you know it's essentially a, a tendon sheath injection the needle ends up in the tendon sheath um, and, and therefore it flows up and down the sheath um, and that's how it works but yeah that's the mid-axial technique and I would uh, I'd, can highly recommend that um, do you find ultrasound a useful tool in MSK hand assessment? Yes, absolutely. Um, since I qualified as a sonographer about five or six years ago, um, I find it exceptionally useful in hands. Um, it can be, it can be. You can see the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. You can see all of the tendons around the wrist. You can see the ulnar nerve. You can check for synovitis. You can see things moving in real time. Uh, you can see where the source of a ganglion is. Um, you know, you can check ligament stability. Uh, you can check for um, you can check for uh, the joint margins. You can see how they look like uh, in terms of joint health and the early signs of osteoarthritis. Um, it's an invaluable tool uh, and really really helpful, as well as obviously doing the various image guided injections and aspirations and other procedures um, as well. So yeah, if you get the opportunity to um, to learn how to um, use ultrasound or and even better to go through a PG cert course and become a qualified sonographer then I would highly recommend it it's really really useful particularly for hands okay sorry about that I had a bit of a technical issue um, back again now though um, and on to the next question so um, how do you treat occupational wrist pain in office workers yeah so they can be a bit of a difficult group can't they mainly because um, they don't get much opportunity to rest it's often computer or mouse use or posture or something that they're doing repetitively day in, day out, um, often for weeks and months on end. Um, and it's really d drilling down, I think, with those patients as to exactly what they're doing, what their job involves, and trying to work out the offending activity. It's often tendon related. Um, and in my experience, the mouse is often one of the main culprits. So one of the first things I'll often do is try and get them to get an occupational ergonomic assessment but uh, maybe suggest a change in mouse and, and one of the ones that I recommend is the penguin mouse which is an ergonomic mouse um, it comes in three or four different sizes depending on your wrist circumference and it sits your wrist into this really nice um, position which is much more neutrally and which much more anatomically neutral um, and is a much less irritable position than that sort of classic wrist cock back and using your fingers um, position of, the, of a standard mouse so yeah penguin mouse can be helpful you can also get ergonomic keyboards that just manipulate the position of your wrist into a slightly uh, more functional position uh, but one of the most in, one of the best things that i can often recommend is using a riser desk you know a standing desk if they can actually stand up for 50 60 or even 70 percent of the day 
then that can often be really helpful because they're not in one position they're shifting the weight around they're often you know moving around the desk they're adopting different positions um, and that's a far healthier environment in which to work so yeah i'll be i'll be looking at that sort of thing really um, do you do hydro dissection procedures for cubital tunnel syndrome yes i do i did mention those in the presentation mainly because the evidence is a little bit it's not it's not really brilliant to be honest um, but i have done them so hydro dissection basically involves um, injecting saline solution usually you can inject anesthetics as well but around nerves unless you're sort of blocking the nerve then uh, saline solution is normally what's needed but you use ultrasound guidance and you inject all the way around the nerve to try and almost trying to peel the nerve is that the right word but trying to sort of divide the nerve from the surrounding tissue so um it's it's more i would normally consider it for somebody that's not so much somebody that's got early symptoms where they i can imagine the nerve being very inflamed and irritable um, and painful but maybe during somebody that's got more chronic symptoms where there's a very mechanical dysfunction so they've had it for a good number of months and every time they bend their elbow they're getting these symptoms so i'm envisaging you know the nerve just not sliding freely through the cubital tunnel then a hydro dissection procedure might be something worth considering um, before maybe thinking about surgery but the other reason why i didn't mention it because it's not really offered at very many places um, and there's not many people that do them it is quite a skilled procedure and you've got to be a sonographer who's very familiar and competent um, in order to offer it you can also do it for for carpal tunnel syndrome as well um, you know it's an alternative to injecting a carpal tunnel is to do a hydro dissection um, so again you pop the needle just above the nerve um, and you inject a few mils of saline and then you move it to just underneath and eventually you have the nerve sitting in a little bubble of saline um, and then you get the patient to do some you know flexion extension type wrist exercises to floss the median nerve if you like stop it from sticking down again um, and it's something worth considering but we're still really waiting for data to come out to show that it's a potentially helpful procedure or more helpful than just a standard injection um okay i have a patient with a non-healed mallet finger what are the options okay well if it's if it's not painful then i would just leave it alone um all they will have is a slightly droopy uh, dip joint it won't affect their function normally at all they'll be able to grip perfectly well unless they've got a desire to hold their finger perfectly straight for a particular activity um, then having a slightly drooped finger at rest shouldn't really bother them much at all um, if it's painful then the only surgical option is really going to be to fuse the the joint um, and they would fuse it in a bent position anyway so that you've got a functional grip um, you know so but it would take the pain away so basically if it's not painful just leave it alone ignore it it's not a big deal um, if it is painful then it's it's fusion of the dip joint um, and then uh we'll make this the, the, the last one so um do you advise doing your hand injections under ultrasound guidance no not necessarily no if you if you aren't trained to do that then a lot of the hand injections you don't have to do um you know under image guidance it certainly makes it easier for certain things but let's say the queer veins no real need that's you know doing it unguided is perfectly fine um Carpal tunnel syndrome I used to do for, for years and it's only really since I've been scanning the wrists and I've seen anatomical variants like bifid median nerves and persistent radial arteries, persistent arteries within the carpal tunnel um, I've made me a little bit more antsy about doing them unguided um, but you know it's perfectly fine to do so um, you know if you're comfortable doing the small injections unguided that's fine i mean you might find that you have to do a bit more fiddling around because the needle is unlikely to drop perfectly into the joint space of an ip joint um you know or an mcp joint so you might have to accept the fact that you have to you might have to be moving your needle around and trying to find the joint space until eventually it drops in but again if you're happy to do that then that's absolutely fine um so yeah yeah, I would always say, you know, at least give it a go once if you're happy. And then if, if you've got the option of referring on for image guided injections, then you could consider that as being a next step if need be. Um, 
but no certainly you know give it a go if you're competent and you're happy to do so okay so i think we'll leave it there for the questions um because we've been going for a while now um yeah so thanks very much for inviting me i hope it's been helpful um again you can you can see a lot of the information i've mentioned before on my youtube channel i've also got a website physiomsk.com so there's quite a bit of information up there granted most of it is directed at patients um but if you do have patients with these conditions and you want to direct them to some information then uh, please please do so um and that's about it so thanks very much indeed uh, take care and bye for now <laughs> Thank you.